Pat Jenny, president of the Salisbury Forum, and on behalf of my fellow board members, we welcome you to this evening's program featuring Roy Blunt, Jr. As we continue to enjoy meeting in person, we're asking that all of you wear these masks throughout the program this evening to protect yourselves and us from COVID, of course. Thank you to Housatonic Valley Regional High School, whose principal is here with us today, this evening, for hosting the program. And thanks to our sponsors, including Connecticut Humanities, which provides grants to organizations like Salisbury Forum that connect people and ideas. And of course, thanks to all of you who generously make contributions that allow us to provide these programs free to the public. We're about to send out our 2022 donation request, so we are most grateful for all of your contributions. Now, coming attractions for Salisbury Forum. On Friday, November 18th at 7.30, Yale Law Professor Akil Reed Amar will join us at Hotchkiss School to discuss the U.S. Constitution its history and its critical role in safeguarding our rights and our democracy. We also will have 125 copies of his most recent book, which is called The Words That Made Us. We'll be distributing this and Professor Amar will be signing them at the end of the forum. And for the first time since 2020, we will resume our annual documentary film screening in January, in fact on Sunday, January 15th at the Millertown Movie House, and we have an exciting documentary to show, so stay tuned. The Salisbury Forum does not have an office or a paid staff, so our board members play many roles to identify and host the speakers that we have at these forums. Now we're in our 17th year and we are reviewing and renewing our communications and technology so that we can involve more of the community, more of you, in our planning. We certainly welcome always your ideas on topics and speakers and are looking for ways to expand our reach to more diverse audiences. So please stay in touch with us via our website, salisburyforum.org, or sending us an email. This evening, we are in for a treat. I have to say that researching information about Roy Blunt Jr. for this introduction was a lot of fun. Just to give you an idea, one source from Ray's website is called, quote, self-promotional bio, third person. <laughs> He's truly a renaissance man of letters. He has 24 published books that cover topics from hanging out with the Pittsburgh Steelers for a year, his first book that was published in 1974, to a topic such as what barnyard animals think. <laughs> Roy Blunt Jr. was raised in Decatur, Georgia, near, as he told us this evening over dinner, near Atlanta. He was educated at Vanderbilt, where, as he told us this evening also, he was on a sports writing scholarship, and at Harvard and he currently splits the year between Berkshire County and New Orleans with his wife, Joan Griswold, a, a, and a very accomplished local artist who is with us tonight. As many of you know, Roy has been a panel on NPR's Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. He's been a New York Public Library literary lion and a Boston Public Library literary light and a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers and Penn America. He's performed at the American Place Theater in New York City on Prairie Home Companion, the CBS Morning Show, The Tonight Show, The Today Show, and many more. He's written columns for Esquire, Inside Sports, The New York Times, and The Atlanta Journal. His essays and stories, and yes, even drawings, have appeared in hundreds of different periodicals, including The Atlantic and Vanity Fair. Roy has written a screenplay with Bill Murray. He's performed in films. He's lectured at Harvard at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan, the San Diego Forum, and many others. 
He also has performed with a rock band that had the title, the name, Rock Bottom Remainders. A group of writers were members of this band, and they once performed on stage with Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> so, we are so pleased to have Roy here tonight, so please join me in welcoming him to the Salisbury. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. I uh, appreciate that introduction. I've been introduced a lot, and um, and you got all of everything right. <laughs> I, sometimes I have to run out and grab the introducer and say, I'm sorry, but uh, it's blunt, not blount. It should be blount. I mean, I, I know it should be blount. It's spelled blount, but it's pronounced blount. But I remember being introduced uh, at the uh, New York at the New York uh, Literary Lion, New York Public Library Literary Lions, and a 20th anniversary dinner. This was quite a while back, uh, but it was after they would have every year they would have uh, these fundraising things at the public library, and um, uh, there'd be a lot of uh, they'd have, have like 20 uh, distinguished persons such as myself as uh, as the literary lions. And after 20 years of that, they had a big uh, anniversary. And so there, by this time, there were, no, it was a, yeah, 20th anniversary. So there were like 400 of us. It, it kind of cheapened the whole thing, if you ask me. <laughs> but uh, there were a lot of us, and um, we, they had to organize us in some way to introduce us. Um, and what they did was, they set us up outside. There was this big literary dining hall, and uh, all of our the uh, f uh, people, the money people who were floating the library were out there waiting for us to have uh, to go to their tables, where they were going to ask us the um, two questions that you should never ask an author, which is, "How is your book coming?" <laughs> and "How is your book doing?" But it was for a good cause, so we all lined up, and um, I, it was sort of interesting to find how I stood in the ranks of all these uh, distinguished authors. Um, and they lined us up to get ready to go into this uh, beautiful glittery dining hall, and they, it was a lot like uh, school, you know. Um, uh, Meryl Streep once told the Yale graduating class that she said, you are leaving college now and uh, you'll find that real life is not like college. Real life is like high school. <laughs> but sometimes the literary life is more like grammar school because they had us lined up. It was like lining up outside the lunchroom, you know, and, um, and they had us lined up alphabetically. So, you could kind of get a sense of, you know, I was in between uh, Judy, uh, Harold Bloom and Judy Bloom. <laughs> and I got on great with Judy Bloom, but somehow Harold and I just didn't hit it off. I don't know. He had written a book uh, called The Book of, he had written the introduction to a book called The Book of Jay, which was about some uh, uh, early uh, biblical text that someone had discovered, and, it, uh, and Harold Bloom wrote a, an introduction to this book in which he argued that it uh, seemed from the, this new text that um, Je Jehovah was a woman. And I said to him, just, you know, I said, oh, that'd be uh, kind of a good way to meet with it. Um, <laughs> He didn't, he didn't care for that. He didn't care for that. Uh, so, so, but, and this was kind of happening just because you're, uh, you're all B BLs, you know, doesn't mean you're going to get along. And this was happening all up and down the line. And there was a guy at the door who was in charge of getting us all in there, right, introduced and worked in right. And he had a clipboard, you know, and he was very worried. And he was looking, he would peek through into the glittery dining hall 
and he would wave to us to be quiet. And um, then he would notice that we were, you know, that, that bees were wandering over into the jays, elves were wandering over into the R's, and he said, people, I can't do this. If you don't line up. So we would shuffle back into place, you know, feeling kind of, uh, kind of uh, grammar schoolized, like that, you know. And um, he, uh, and so, but I was, being a bee, I was pretty close to the beginning of the, of the line. So I got introduced pretty early. And the, and the guy was holding me out, holding me off, and looking at holding me off, and, and then, and he pushed me in, and I heard the voice of Barbara Walters. I'm, just, I'm glad this crowd, crowd is uh, uh, distinguished enough to remember <laughs> Barbara Walters. Uh, she was, you know, a big, big news star, and uh, I heard the voice, and I knew where my table was, and it all worked out. I was heading toward my table when I heard Barbara Walters sing, and now, a novelist, no, I didn't know anybody, I thought I had sort of slipped that novel in there, and I appreciated that Barbara Walters knew that I had uh, written a novel, and she said, a humorist, and I'm now, yeah, I'm good, okay, and incidentally, a very good cook, and I was nonplussed because, um, I mean, I can cook a little bit. I can cook for myself or for children, <laughs> young children. But, you know, and um, Barbara will help. I don't, you know, I thought I had better change my way of living because uh, there have been things that I have done at night, not recently, but uh, over the years that I don't remember. <laughs> I know that's true. <laughs> One time, in fact, I uh, woke up in a New Orleans hotel room. It was my hotel room. That was fine so far, but I got up and I looked in the mirror and there in the bathroom, there in the middle of my forehead was a big, Splotch, this is gout, heavy thing of blood. And I thought, oh, I better, I better slow down because I, you know, uh, I don't remember, uh, especially if you're a writer, you need, if you had gotten sh shot the night before, you need to remember that because you got, to, you got to use that. You can't just get shot and not and waste it. <laughs> so, uh, but then I turned on my light in the bathroom, and I had not been shot. I had just slept on my complimentary mint. <laughs> but as I say, I have forgotten things that I've done. But I couldn't imagine ever forgetting cooking for Barbara Walters. <laughs> Um, and so I was sort of looking back over my shoulder at Barbara Walters as she finished up her, my introduction, dot, 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 Nora Ephron. <laughs> and there was a smattering of applause, and I uh, sat down, and see, what had happened was that we got out of line, <laughs> and everybody was a little bit off. <laughs> at one point, uh, Tony Randall, remember Tony Randall, took over from Barbara Walters, second half of the alphabet, and all of his people were wrong too, and, but people, people just went right along. Uh, at one point, uh, he said, George Plimpton, and a little Indian woman walked out. <laughs> Maharati Mukherjee, and um, just, so uh, all I'm saying is that uh, literary recognition is not always what it's cracked up. <laughs> but I've enjoyed being a writer, and um, I've, um, done just about every kind of writing. Um, I did a lot of sports writing. There was, uh, uh, I did a story with, uh, where I wrote a story with Wilt Chamberlain. Now you probably know who Wilt Chamberlain was. I mean, he was a, an enormously tall basketball player. He was set, supposed to be seven feet tall, but 
I suspect he was taller than that because I turned to him once. It, we were in the elevator and I saw that my eye level was at his elbow level. He was just standing there. So he was a big man. And um, I was, he was going to announce that he was retiring as an active player. And I was working at Sports Illustrated and they assigned me to write the story with him as told to me. So I went out to LA and uh, up to Bel Air in the hills where he had a house. It was an interesting house. The, it was tall, it was big enough for him. It was a little taller than this. <laughs> but it was about right for him. And um, he had a, a decorative feature that I have never seen in anybody else's uh, house. It was um, wolf muzzles. He had uh, wolf muzzle carpet. They just sewn together, you know, it had a kind of herringbone effect somehow. Not the nose, just the, just the fur. I, I'm sure he must, his decorator must have, there must have been some kind of big wreck or something, and a lot of them just put roadkill wolves and hard to come by, but he had somehow gotten all these wolf muzzles sewn together into carpets and um, you know, upholstery and uh, it was all over everywhere. And um, he also had a lot of friends there who were not as big as he was, but they were big enough to be his friends. And they were there to protect him from me because he had done a story for Sports Illustrated like this before once, years before, and he had felt mis misquoted by it. He, uh, it was when he first started in the NBA, and he said the, NBA, the headline was, the NBA is a Bush League, which he felt he shouldn't have said, or didn't say, didn't want it to be the headline anyway, and he had made a clear deal with Sports Illustrated that he had to read everything including the headlines. He had to check off on everything because it was him talking, but me kind of having, and you know, a lot of athletes, you know, they talk pretty well, but it's not the kind of talk that works on the page. But Wilt was, uh, you know, well-spoken, and um, and he uh, he would talk, and it was, you know, I would fiddle with it a little bit, just like, as you would with anybody, but he would tell, tell the reasons why he was leaving the league and everything, and it, uh, it worked pretty well, and, uh, we, uh, so, but he was still didn't know whether to trust the magazine. We, he and I got along, but uh, so we had all these friends there, these big friends, and they were just sort of waiting for me to make a misstep or for me, the magazine, to make a misstep. Somehow or another, they were going to have to jump in and protect Will. So I, I wrote, wrote the story with Will and sent it off. But um, back then, they don't, you know, now, of course, you hit a button and, and the story goes out. But in those days, you had to type it up and then you had to, they had these sort of, uh, Hunter Thompson called them a mojo machine, where you, you would get a uh, type script and feed it into the phone. And the phone somehow would uh, uh, feed it into the machine which connected to the phone, which would then transfer it to uh, somewhere else. And so we had done that. and. Uh, and then they were sending back the edited copy from New York. And it, it started creeping out, you know, come out of this machine, we'd be waiting. And the guys were, his friends were just sort of milling around behind me saying things like, you know, and just sort of muttering. And um, I, uh, uh, so the first, the, the, all of the text, the copy, the body of the story came through and Wilt read through it and proved it all. But then, the um, headlines started coming through. Um, and the, uh, how did it go? the main headline was, my impact, quote, my impact will be everlasting, which he had said, and he approved of that. He thought that was commensurate with his stat uh, stature. And um, then, however, the subhead started coming in. And it came over and I read it and handed it up, handed up to Will Green. <laughs> and it said, um, a dominant force in basketball announces his retirement from the game. 
And uh, Wilt said, um, <clears throat> a dominant force. <laughs> and, and his friends started saying things like, a dominant. A dominant. Dominant. A dominant. And um, uh, so it, I said, um, I get the sense that you would prefer the dominant. And he said, that's right. And, uh, but it, I, could, I knew that that wouldn't fit. That this would not fit into this, this space there. Yeah, so I didn't know. What, so I called up to call back to New York to Fort Hill State. Now, uh, and the, um, the editor of the story was not, was not there. But uh, we had a wonderful uh, telephone operator named Mildred. And Mildred uh, was, uh, no, her name was Muriel. Geez, I forgot her name. Muriel. And Muriel was, um, you know, she, the White House operators can do this, I guess. You call in trying to get somebody in the White House, and they will find that person wherever he or she is and tap them into the, the phone. And Muriel could do that. She, she, was, she was really, really talented. She, was also, she also did not take any guff from anybody. We had, this, had a kind of imperious um, uh, managing editor named Andre Laguerre, who had been de Gaulle's information officer in World War II. And he didn't take any guff off anybody either. But one time he slammed his phone down and um, it rang immediately. He picked it up and it was Muriel. And Muriel said, angry if everyone in the building whanged his receiver, I would have to have brain surgery. <laughs> so he never whanged his receiver again. <laughs> but anyway, but Muriel was able to find this editor, in, but unfortunately she found him where I was afraid she would find him, which was in a um, uh, bar called the Ho Ho, a Chinese restaurant called, I don't know what Ho Ho means in Chinese, but. Uh, Whatever it meant, that was where it was right. It had two virtues, that restaurant. It had, um, it was right next to the Time and Life building where uh, Sports Illustrated was in those days. And it also, every fourth drink was free. <laughs> so, you know, if you think about it, do the math. It doesn't hardly pay not to have eight. <laughs> and, this editor was in about his sixth or seventh when um, uh, we reached him. And I said, um, I'm here with Will. And uh, the editor said, I don't, I don't know what the editor is. Will, I am good. What do you do? I'm here. And, the, and then his friends were beginning to wander around saying things like, A Dominant, doing A Dominant. But come into the man's home and call him A Dominant. That's my friend. <laughs> And, uh, and I couldn't get, couldn't make, get the uh, editor to make any sense. I tried to get him to say, we need to try to change it to the dominant and the other one. Oh, I don't know, the A, I don't know. I just couldn't get through to him at all. And uh, so I said, well, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to talk to him directly. So I passed the phone up to uh, Will, and um, he said to uh, yeah, it's Will Chairman here. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, well, I know, I know what the meaning of, I know the meaning of, uh, uh, all right, all right, all right. And to my astonishment, I was seeing Will being mollified. And he handed me back the phone and looked down and said, who the hell is Miller? Miller! <laughs> <laughs> who the hell is Miller? <laughs> God, I'm going to go to hell for not remembering Mildred's name. Here, who the hell is So I always think that there's some little principle of salvation, or some kind of, if I'm in trouble somewhere, that I know Muriel won't be there, but somebody will spring up to, uh, from, from some angle to. And with that in mind, I was, I was in the um, subway. I was supposed to do a one-man show at the American Place Theater some years ago and in New York. And I was afraid I wasn't ready for the, uh, 
in New York State. So I thought, here's what I'll do. I will try, try, my, try out on the subway. <laughs> but, you know, you have people playing music on the subway and stuff, and uh, no reason you couldn't have a, have a one-man show on the subway, just a little bit of one. So I got, uh, I went to the subway. And as I walked into the car and was getting my nerve up, I heard there was a couple having an argument right, uh, right near where I was standing. And uh, they were interesting in one way because they had uh, lots, both of them, had lots of snakes. Now, nowadays, of course, every third person has snakes tattooed all over the place. I'm probably the only one in this crowd who doesn't have a snake tattooed on himself somewhere. But these people had snakes tattooed to the point where they just seemed to be teeming with snakes. They had a head sticking out here and a tail coming in here. And they were also having an odd sort of argument, which was that she, uh, he was saying, uh, you know, uh, she was saying, he was saying, you don't sh share your life with me. And she said, what do you mean? I, uh, what, what don't I share with you? And he said, uh, how about Francesco? And she said, oh, well, I thought you knew about Francesco. I mean, he's just one of the first people I met when I came to the city, and he had a party for me. He's just a very nice man. And he said, see? See, that's exactly what I mean. Who the hell is Francesco? I threw out the first name I think of, and then it is Francesco. <laughs> and she said, he said, I just pull a name out of the air. And uh, she, so I didn't, didn't do my show in the subway. <laughs> didn't do deep with that. Um, but it, I, what I did do when I did the thing in the American Place Theater was I opened up the floor for questions, preliminary questions intermediate halfway through the show questions. And, um, and that worked out. In fact, I think a lot of plays could be improved <laughs> if there were questions early on before, before it's too late. Before it's over. <laughs> Othello, for instance, a tragedy could be averted if the crowd had a few questions. So I thought we might do that at this midpoint here right, right now. Um, Anybody got a question? <laughs> this is the last one. I would love to sell it to somebody, but I don't want to. Uh, questions? Yeah. Being a humorist, do you find with everything that's going on in the world right now, it's difficult to find humor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my question is, am I fine with everything that is going on in the world? Right now? <laughs> do I find it funny? Well, it's, I've got a little laugh already. <laughs> the notion that anybody would be fine with anything that's going on in the world right now. Uh, well, that is a problem, I think. Uh, you don't want, you can't, uh, it's tricky. Um, I think that, um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, you can't make fun. I've, I've never thought that you had to make fun of people in order to be funny about people. You know, you can uh, make fun with people. You can talk about how funny they are. But uh, when you get to Donald Trump, all that breaks down. I think uh, he is just utterly unfunny and thinks he is funny, and that's a terrible combination. So it's hard to compete. And Joe Biden, I don't know whether he's funny or not because I didn't catch what he just said. <laughs> so, I, you know, I think that the earth, uh, you know, I'm 81 years old. If I were 18, I would really be pissed off. Yeah. As it is, um, um, what can I do? Everything, I just, we were just reading that the Mississippi, we live near the Mississippi River when we were in New Orleans, 
and it's drying up. The Mississippi River is drying up. Uh, you know, and all kinds of things are being exposed. Um, more politicians, I'm afraid, <laughs> pop up from, from, the, from, the, from the river. It's, um, you know, I just try to, try to but I, I just try to uh, talk about how strange it all is. It does, if we ever lose track of how strange it all is, then we really will, really will be in trouble. So, uh, uh, strangeness will have to do for humor sometimes. Anybody else? Yes, yes. Have you got any stories about uh, your book on the Pittsburgh Steelers that you can share with us? Yeah, I wrote a spin, my first book was a, a, about spending a whole season with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Not playing, but uh, uh, hanging out with the Steelers. And um, I learned a lot of things there. One is the principle of uh, drink through it. <laughs> you know, when you're hurt, if you really, I, probably not true anymore, but in those days, 1973, you know, they were tough, and they, if you're hurt, just play through it. And if you're drunk, drink through it. <laughs> uh, it's not something that probably, I mean, I'm 81, I think, so uh, uh, I uh, it didn't kill me, but uh, and it sort of works. It, it works until you fall down. <laughs> and, and you, uh, but it works until you fall down, and you have to, uh, in football, you have to fall down a lot to get up. So. But uh, there were great characters on that team. There was Frenchy Fuqua. Uh, was a, he, uh, I never saw these shoes. He was a fancy dresser. And uh, he supposedly had shoes, high heel shoes, with transparent heels, with um, goldfish swimming in the heels. <laughs> so he was famous for how he dressed. That's why he's called himself Frenchy. Uh, Frenchy was. A fancy name, as indeed it is. Prince Fugler, he was, he got hurt, and uh, he was on the sideline, uh, and I was standing next to him, and I looked over in the stands, and there was a guy in a purple fur coat, a purple fur coat, and I came up to Frenchy, and I said, Frenchy, Frenchy, there's a guy over here with, in a purple fur coat, full length purple fur coat. And Frenchy didn't even turn around. He said, yeah, that's Henderson, my tailor. <laughs> yeah. Did you uh, meet Steve Bless? He went to this high school. Uh, well, I knew that he was from Fall Village, yeah. I did meet Steve Bless. Uh, his, his Pirates teams, the 70s Pirates teams, were my favorite teams to cover. And I remember Bless, um, tying his tie so that it was really short. And um, it's hard to say why you do that, but he had a little short tie. And we were getting on the plane as he, he introduced himself to the stewardess and said, hello, I'm the guy in the short tie. <laughs> he, he <laughs> can, can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Bill Murray on a play? Talk about a collaboration with Bill Murray. Yeah, we brought a, um, a, it's a movie that didn't do all that well. I mean, it did, you know, it, it opened, it opened at $40 million or something, but that didn't, wasn't enough. Um, and so it was my only real uh, movie credit, except I've acted in a few things. But um, he uh, just sort of, I had done a story with him, uh, about him for GQ or somebody. And I met him several times. I knew him from, he was in sports. Uh, somehow or another we met, uh, hanging around with some athletes. And uh, he asked me to write, there was this movie called, I don't know what it was called, to begin with actually, but it uh, involved an elephant, getting an elephant, uh, inheriting an elephant. That was the whole, the whole thing. And the original one involved the elephant uh, somehow going down into the bottom of a lake and pulling a bus full of um, uh, children out of, of the bottom of the lake. He then run off into the lake. 
And I thought, well, I'll just, because somebody had already written this, uh, and I was rewriting somebody's script, and I thought, oh, I'll change everything except, hey, who doesn't want to see an elephant pull a bus for children? <laughs> out from the bottom of the lake. That's it, I'll just say elephant, but you know, it's uh, not really a writer's problem, you know, you just say elephant. Uh, elephant is seen going in the water, and, uh, but uh, the director said, uh, the prospective director said, uh-uh, I don't know how to direct a scene in which an elephant pulls a bus. So I didn't have my elephant pulling a bus climax. So, I, but, I, so but I did figure out that Murray played a, uh, uh, you know, you call it, uh, motivational speaker. So he could talk to the uh, elephant and he opened doing the motivation. And they liked it, and the movie people did. So I wrote a bunch of dialogue and threw it in some more. There's um, a uh, old joke about a guy who was poaching uh, fish, no, poaching deer, out in the uh, woods, you know, and he came up to carrying the deer on his shoulders to his car and uh, his truck, I guess. He was getting ready to drive home with the deer, and he saw the game warden standing right there. There he was with the deer. And the game warden said, um, okay, well, what, do you, what do you got to say for yourself? And the guy said, I don't know, uh, what, what, why do I have to say anything? And the game warden said, how about that deer? And the guy went, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I used that at some point, and the elephant came up behind him. <laughs> used things like that. And we, uh, and at one point, uh, the, we had, I had this small circus. They, he heard, he thought he could go to the circus, the zoo, and the zoo would help him get, he had to get the elephant to the west coast. Why, I forget why. But, um, so I had this little zoo, little petting zoo. I mean, I read somewhere, said so we were just meeting people, going around with elephants. Going, Is there a zoo around here? And, and somebody would say, oh yeah, you know, uh, 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 Ferguson's Zoo right down here. Just a bit. So we went down and we found that Ferguson's Zoo was tiny little creatures, little bitty animals, rabbits and things like that. You know, a little petting zoo. And it turns out that elephant, this was a great elephant. Her name, her real name was Ty, T-A-Y, and she's been in lots of elephant movies. Then, in fact, if you go to her uh, page on, uh, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, What's the name of the page? Wikipedia. We, no, uh, IMDb, Intimate Movie Database. Go to her IMDb page, it says, uh, uh, this, it talks about uh, where she lives and everything, and then it says in the department where it says trivia, it says trivia, colon, she is an elephant. <laughs> There's nothing trivial about trivial about being an elephant out of the box. She was great. They swam together and stuff. But it turns out that elephants don't like apparently the whole thing about elephants not liking mice, you know, being afraid of mice is apparently true. Because she was going around and all these little rabbits and things were, were playing with the elephant and she was kicking them out. It was awkward. And she, and she didn't step on any of them, but she would just kick them. There would be a, you know, we were trying to do the scene, and then all of a sudden there would be a little rabbit flying through the air. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, what is your favorite story from Wake Wake Don't Tell Me? And is Peter Sagal naturally witty and funny, or are all of his uh, statements uh, scripted? Uh, a lot of Peter's statements are scripted. He does have a script, but he helps to write it, and also he ad lives off of that. So he is with He also gets uh, things, gets jokes. You know, it's awful to have. We had that show. Start, I've forgotten the man's name, but that show started with an MC who was perfect, except that he didn't get jokes. You know, it was supposed to be a funny show, and. You'd say something and there would be a pause. <laughs> and then you'd say something else and there'd be another pause. And this wasn't going over until Peter became the MC. And it started working. And then Carl, of course, was there. And, and now we got all these. 
But uh, I don't, it's, it's fun backstage. The, I would say the Prairie Home Companions backstage is more fun because they're people, I mean, not anymore, but people uh, are back there making mouth sounds, you know, they're acting mouth sounds, and then there are people uh, who are playing nose flutes, I don't know, you know all, all kind of stuff. And we don't have the nose flutes and the mouth sounds, but backstage, but it's funny back there. People are making, are, are being funny. And um, I don't, what I can do right now is read you a couple. Of, my favorite thing about uh, doing Wait Wait is, um, you know, we one idea we had recently, my wife and I, is uh, for a new game is Senior Jeopardy. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd say, uh, you know the answer, you know, I, I know it, I know it. <laughs> Come back and you just give me that one. I mean, you're going to give me one. Just pin down. It's coming. It's coming. I'll get it. But uh, uh, an offshoot of that would be wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Don't, don't, don't tell me. Wait. Um, but of course, uh, anyway, but my favorite thing, we don't, the uh, panelists don't, you know, we don't know what's coming. We make, we have to. Uh, ad lib, but we do know the topic of the bluff, the bluff the listener uh, story. And that's my favorite thing because you can actually make stuff up. It goes like this. Here's an example. Jocelyn Wofford of Milwaukee was turning 40 and she was laid off from her guidance counselor job and laid up with a broken leg. And her husband, Travis, insisted he had to leave town on business. To make up for it, he lined up surprise presents, a home visit massage, and membership in both the Wine of the Month and the Fruit of the Month clubs. When he returned from his trip, there were four strangers in his house, <laughs> sobbing and hugging Jocelyn. See, when the masseur arrived, the delivery guy was waiting with a box of pears. When Jocelyn hobbled to the door, smashed pears were everywhere and the guys were wrestling on the ground. Turned out, small world, they were both seeing the same local woman. Jocelyn's counseling instincts came out. She brought the guys in to talk things through, which they did. And the wine delivery, wine delivery guy arrived, and he took an interest. The four of them talked, and finally the massage guy admitted that the fruit guy was actually right for the girl, so they invited her over. <laughs> and they all sang happy birthday, and drank some wine, and had massages, and ate the rest of the pears, pears and stayed the night. And there was more fruit in the truck, so they stayed another night. And Jocelyn and the massage guy decided they were right for each other. And they were all five crying. They were so happy. And that's when Travis came home. All this came out in divorce court this week. If only, said Travis, I had given her just the massage, or just the wine, or just the fruit. Here's another. What do folks ingest these days when they're raving all night to techno pop? Techno pop. Benzodioxylmethylpropanamine, popularly known as Molly, or so I'm told. But if an extra oxygen molecule slips in there, You've got benzotrioxal, the accidental offshoot known as O-Molly. <laughs> Whereas Molly makes you feel all ecstatic and rubbery, O-Molly induces an intense craving for weepy old Irish ballads. <laughs> Understandably, O-Molly has caused havoc on club dance floors. When you're gyrating to Electro Clash, 
with the laser, laser lights and all, the last thing you want is people standing there glaring at you and crooning Danny Boy, <laughs> or worse. According to a study issued this week by the Drug Enforcement Administration, no fatal overdoses of O'Malley have been reported. But a Boston DJ was beaten and thrown through a plate glass window for refusing to sample My Cheek on Mother's Tattered Shawl, a song virtually impossible to twerk to. One more. It doesn't take long for a small morsel of fatty pork to pass through a duck. Alton Emery of Canardia, New Hampshire, who has ducks, noticed this, and it gave him an idea for a surefire viral video. He tied a piece of fatty pork to a greased length of twine and placed it in his duck yard. And soon he had a string of ducks <laughs> going on with their lives unruffled because Emory allowed for adequate slack. But the video footage, four ducks, then five ducks, then six, didn't look like much. And the local Humane Society got wind of his project. Last week, as Emory stood in the yard arguing with the Humane Society guy, an eagle swooped down grabbed the sixth duck and flew off with the whole string. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it, as the other five ducks, one at a time, slid down the string, fell through the air, and landed on his pond, Emery's camera was in the house. <laughs> so are there any questions about what we've covered so far? Um, well, let's see. I, I love this kind of question because uh, my whole life is devoted to uh, covering up embarrassing moments. Uh, the other night, John and I went to a play, uh, for Searching for Godot. You know that play, Becky's play. And uh, now my wife is, is, is blushing. Um, it's in, it was a theater in Pittsfield, and um, <laughs> there was, um, I'm 81 years old, <laughs> and I had had uh, probably a beer or two before the show. And as the show swung into its uh, 50th uh, uh, weird, um, strange, uh, uh, reflective, uh, exchange of uh, uh, gnomic utterances, <laughs> I noticed that the only way to get, well, there was another way. There were two ways, but the least obtrusive way to get from my seat and the, um, uh, <laughs> and the restroom was to walk not across the middle of the stage, but through the play. I had to walk through the play. Otherwise, I would have to go around and everybody would see me. So I, I just walked through the play. And uh, I heard people saying, is he got to go? That was embarrassing. I never had to do that on uh, Oh, wait, wait, don't tell me. I'm trying to think. It's hard to be embarrassed when uh, it's not, I mean, it's live, but it's not going to, if you say anything really stupid, they can cut it out. So uh, there's that. You got that going for you. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not the kind of person who does embarrassing things. <laughs> or who, I'm not the kind of person who remembers things. And so I put those two things together and uh, I've got a pretty clean slate. 
But I have been on the new, on the you know the uh, stage in Pittsfield, the legitimate theater. I've been in the legitimate theater, uh, so I don't really I shouldn't have to be funny. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about a gig that you have not done that you would like to. A gig that I have not done that I would like to. Well, Queen Elizabeth is dead now. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really want to appear before. I can't think of a crowned head I would like to. I would love to have cracked up Queen Elizabeth. Well, hey, everybody would. I mean, that's a common, common thing. Uh, I don't know what what jokes I would try on her. I wouldn't have told her about the walking through uh, waiting for Godot. <laughs> But, but I bet she would have, could have dealt with it. You know, she probably, I don't know what the uh, queen does, but if the queen had been, had been with me there, I bet I could have asked her advice, and she said, oh dear. Um, a gig that I should have, I would like to have done. Uh, I wish that, you know, the, like some of the old TV shows, I would love to have been in I Love Lucy. You know, I don't know what I would have done, but, uh, you know, new TV is, is good in its way, but it's not mythic. I would like to have been done something mythic. Just walk through the honeymooners or something, you know. Y'all don't remember the honeymooners. Yeah. Um, what was a great show to be on? I mean, I, I would have liked to... Uh, just bat one. I mean, I did play in a, to write a sport, uh, story for Sports Illustrated, I did play with the 19, uh, what, 69 Cubs, Chicago Cubs, one of those games. Hey, 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 hey. Um, no, it wasn't the Cubs, it was the uh, White Sox. <laughs> no, it was the Cubs, it was the Cubs. <laughs> um, and um, I would love, I would, you know, once I was introduced, uh, Ring Lardner once said that it's embarrassing to, uh, when people ask you what you do, it's embarrassing to say, I'm a humorist. It's like saying, I'm a great third baseman. And that's what I, of course, probably Ring Lardner did too. I wanted to be a great third baseman. But, uh, so this is my fallback thing. But the gig I would like to have is, I would have played with the Pittsburgh Pirates with uh, Steve Blass and all those guys. That would have been great. But it was, and, and Manny Sanguian, remember Manny Sanguian played, played with those Pirates? He was a Panamanian catcher. I remember one time he said, oh, I, I know, they tell me, I swing at the, uh, at the first pitch every time. They tell me, don't, Manny, don't swing at the third first pitch every time, and, but I swing at the first pitch every time. And I said, why do you do that? He said, because it makes me feel good. <laughs> and he, uh, uh, one time he showed me, he, a, uh, he showed me his muscle and he sort of tweaked it. And he said, look here, I got a little muscle on my muscle. Little, little muscle. I don't know where, where he got that. That's what I would like to do. Right now, I would uh, try out for the 1979 <laughs> Pittsburgh Pirates. Anybody else? Yeah. Tell us about the Rock Bottom Remainders. Okay. The Rock Bottom Remainders are a rock and roll band composed of authors, which is not a good idea at all. But somehow, <laughs> uh, we have we have some. We have uh, Stephen King is the is the big attraction because then once we were in we had we were tra we did, for years we've been doing this thing and it's not very musical but it's pretty i mean considering you know it's considering that we're not musicians it's, but one time we were in aretha's old bus we had inherited aretha but we had, somebody said we rented a bus and somebody said you know that's aretha franklin bus we said oh cool we, I guess it's true. At any rate, we were in that bus traveling from city to city, doing all these cool uh, venues, and the, the bus broke down, and we pulled into a, one of those, you know, uh, 
parking places there on the highway, on the interstate, and uh, there was a person there. This was just a completely random, uh, what do you call those places where you, you know, the side of the road is... Uh, rest stop. Rest stop. Not a, yeah, a rest stop, yeah. I mean, not the kind that had food or anything, it's just a, and uh, we pulled in and uh, stopped the bus, and there was somebody, and I guess Steve, we call him Stevie, little Stevie, he came. <laughs> he came, he is the only member of the band who was not, did not have a uh, childhood experience with, uh, with a, um, a satanic uh, figure. <laughs> uh, but he, he came off the bus, <clears throat> and there was a young woman standing there with a copy of The Stand for him to autograph. It's like, there must be people standing everywhere <laughs> in America or the world, hoping that Stephen King's bus will break down <laughs> there, and, he, and they're ready in case, in case he shows up and he can sign their book. But he also, he would have stand fans who would come up to the stage uh, and they would have set fire, they would have had lighter fluid, in, they would have long fingernails and lighter fluid in the fingernails, which they had lit, and they would hold up like this. And I had trouble concentrating. <laughs> but he, he's used to it, I guess. But, and we, it's a lot of Dave Barry's in it, and uh, uh, you know Amy Tan, and uh, it's a great, great bunch of. I'm, and I'm, everybody always says, "What do you play?" I don't play anything. I don't. I, I'm the. I introduce the band, and uh, then I mill around in the background, and then when it comes to wild thing, <laughs> I come in on. You move me. <laughs> that's my soul, right there. <laughs> now, you know that's a kind of a funny song. It, you know, wild thing. You, know. you make my heart sing. You make everything groovy. You know. Wild thing. You, I, I don't know how it goes, but I, I, but I make it a little better. You know, it's kind of old. Everybody's heard the song. But if the person who comes in with "You move me" comes in just slightly. In, at the wrong time. It makes that song. It, it just makes it, it just spins it just a little bit more and you think it's a whole new song, really. So uh, you can you got to hang back, you know, or get forward. You, know, you can either hang back, come in just a little bit late, or you can hold back. I mean, or, you know, jump in a little too soon. It's, uh, I don't know what you call that, what principle of uh, performance that is, but that's, uh, that's what I do in the band, and uh, we do some before that. We, and we've been all over the country playing not well. <laughs> people, people dance to us. I don't know how they do it. They don't dance to wild things so much. <laughs> or if they are dancing, they get, tend to kind of stop when I come in with the movie. Scott, uh, Scott Turo. Uh, Wears a wig and plays a song. We don't have enough women in it. Uh, we, um, the band was formed by Kathy, organized by Kathy Kamen Goldmark, a, uh, the late Kathy Kamen, Kamen Goldmark, wonderful woman, who was an author escort, which sounds uh, sleazy, but it's not at all. It's a, it's a kind of, when you're on a book tour, uh, the escort picks you up and, and it, that sounds sleazy too. Uh, she drives, gets you to the railroad, to the radio station, and knows where to park, and takes you around. And she would, and she was a musician herself. Um, and um, she, uh, but she organized this. And uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. Something. Oh, Kathy. Uh, she married uh, Stephen King's brother, who also plays with us. Uh, not Stephen King's brother. They married brother Sam. Uh, oh, I had a story about Kathy. What is it? I don't know. She, she's the one that got me into it. I'll think this is sort of like, you know, a senior Jeopardy. This is senior um, tail spinning, senior anecdotage. 
I'll, I'll come back when you least expect it. I may have to get in your phone numbers. Or your I don't know. But I'll, I'll come. I'll get back. I'll get back. Don't worry. Yes, sir. What actor would play you in the adaptation of your career? Um, well, a lot of them are dead. <laughs> I need one that's almost dead. I mean. um, I, I think uh, I always like Michael Caine. You know, I just don't want somebody. I don't want somebody. I want somebody who looks who's kind of uh, you know bad, but not uh, evil, I and mean, somebody who's. Uh, I don't, I don't, he doesn't have to be too smart. I don't care. I don't, because smart actors tend to look kind of weaselly. I, mean, I would like, uh, I, I don't want, uh, we watched this whole long thing about Paul Newman. I don't have Paul Newman. Paul Newman does not have my eyes. So he can, uh, I don't know that the person had been born yet who could play me on, in a movie. I mean, it could do some minor things like walk across uh, <laughs> waiting for Godot, but uh, that, that, that would just be a little stage turn. I, I don't know who I would have do that for me, but the story of my life would include that moment because it's visual, you know, walking through, walking through my fair lady would everybody would hate. You know, you, you, the people would be throwing things at you and you were walking through a really good musical. But walking through Waiting for Godot, I think people kind of welcome it. You know. Now, actors, in fact, actors started doing like this and I went like that. It, it, next time you go to see Waiting for Godot, I won't be there, but I bet they do that. I bet they have that in there. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Who was your favorite late night host and why? Who was my favorite late night host and why? Uh, we had a friend who died just recently, he was 93 years old, who was my favorite late night host in real life. Uh, but, uh, well, I, I was on Johnny Carson, and uh, interesting, I was on Tonight Show a number of times. I'm surprised you don't all know that. <laughs> um, and Johnny, call him Johnny, turned to me at one point during the break, and he said, he said there should be a, um, uh, what's the word, in the weather when it's, uh, <laughs> there should be a, um, well, I may have to get back to you on that. <laughs> there should be a, uh, Freeze, freeze, freeze factor. What's the when it's when it's uh, the temperature is seventy? Chill factor. There should be a chill factor for comedy for laughter. He said because you, uh, because they weren't laughing too much at what I was saying. And he turned to me in the break and said there should be a, a factor because in the theater they may not be laughing, but uh, you're talking to. You should probably just forget about that. People in the theater, except it's nice to hear people laugh, but you're talking to me, one thing, and you're talking to the home audience. And you have to sort of factor all that together and average it out. And uh, so you're doing okay. Uh, he was good, Carson, you know, and uh, I was on um, Letterman. Now, Letterman was weird. Uh, I was on Letterman with Bill Murray one time, and Bill Murray came on with. Uh, T-shirts that had uh, the cover of my book on them, and then he couldn't think of anything to say. And the uh, the uh, people, the producers of the show, said, "Don't talk. Let Bill talk." And I said, "Because he's supposed to talk about my book." And he couldn't think of anything to say. And so I was sitting there, and uh, Dave was sitting there, and I said, "Well, it's nice to be sitting here with you, Dave." And that's about. That was the last time I was on. <laughs> that was, um, uh, you know, because uh, um, who else? Was, I mean, I've been on just about all those old. I mean, haven't been on the recent ones because they they're they're ageist. You know, they're all, you never see anybody on on there who's 
older than 79. <laughs> Strict cutoff there. Anybody else? Yeah. No, I did not. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point because uh, that might not have gone over. Yeah. And also, it's a kind of mysterious play, you know. And, uh, and people speculate on the motives of it and what's driving the people and everything. And I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to overdo it. I didn't. Uh, and I, I don't think I missed it. <laughs> they didn't miss me. I mean, not, nobody came up afterwards. That was, I was glad to see that. Uh, nobody said, uh, you know, I, could, I wouldn't have been surprised if I had been arrested. It would have been terrible. God. Well, how, how do you tell people that you were arrested for walking through waiting for Godot? <laughs> Why would you walk through waiting for Godot? Well, you had to see the layout of it. Anybody else? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your hometown and your best friend growing up? Oh. Well, my best, I, I, my hometown was Decatur, Georgia, which was um, named for Stephen Decatur, a, uh, a Revolutionary War hero. And my father was in the savings and loan business back when it was honest. He was, he was like, I'm sorry, y'all probably the same as long as too. But back then, you know, there was no runaway interest or anything. Back then, you you paid people, uh, you know, the interest of 4%, and you uh, lent them money at 6%. And, uh, and my father was very, it was like, uh, it's a wonderful life. He was like, uh, like that guy. And uh, he was a, you know, a great uh, member. He, he was the chairman of the Board of Education when they uh, integrated the schools in Decatur. He was a, he was a, a pillar of the community. And I was, you know, proud of him and all that. But I knew I had to get out of town because, you know, you know there's, uh, his name was Roy Sr. And, you know, so you don't want to be a little pillar. If the community is based on a big pillar and a little pillar, I did it for the community, really. <laughs> Otherwise, it would all slid off with the imbalance. Um, but it was a, a, a good town. It was sort of like a uh, you know, leave it to beaver kind of town. And I was, uh, I, you know, did all this sort of, uh, but I thought I, I was stranger than everybody else in school. I just did it. But then, when the first reunion I went back, I realized that everybody thought they were stranger than everybody else. So, yeah. um, yeah, my best friend, well, I don't know, I had a, a, a friend named David Leverett who went in the Air Force and, uh, and died in a plane crash. But we used to play, we used to play, um, uh, stuff, you know, go out in the woods and play the ball and stuff. Uh, my best friend, I guess, was Chipper, our dog Chipper, who uh, uh, was, I had to defend Chipper a lot because she was uh, kind of a, not a big, you know, she was kind of a frizzy little dog. And, uh, but uh, and people would, uh, Say, oh, I like I see your dog there. Is that your dog? And I say, yes, it is my dog. And she, she can whip your dog, not right now. <laughs> it was a good town to grow up in. Uh, and it's it got even better after all that. The strange thing about it, you expect your smallish town, you know, you expect when you go off to New York and stuff, you, you're more sophisticated when you come back. And your town is, is not really, you know, grown like you have. But I came back in, Decatur had gotten much hipper than I did. And it remains so to today. It's uh, got a great mixture of uh, uh, faculty from Emory uh, University, and uh, a lot of the mayor was, uh, at one time was a, uh, 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 an African-American socialist. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's not a sleepy little southern town. It's, uh, it's right outside Atlanta. 
and it is cool. And I haven't been back there in a long time. But I was there for the Olympics, the Atlanta Olympics. I went to Decatur. The home, the, uh, the town square has a plaque to my father. It says uh, Roy Blunt Senior. Uh, I don't know whether it's a senior or not. Maybe it's just Roy A. Blunt Town Square. Uh, and uh, there's a plaque there. And they had uh, dancers. The uh, sister city of uh, Decatur for the Olympics was, oh, I think it's Uga. What's the capital of. Uh, no, that's another thing. Huh? Yeah. Uh, what's that? Or. What is it? Country was Burkina Faso. Yeah. Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. Burkina Burkina Faso. Faso. Burkina It's Burkina Faso. Anyway, right. they had these wonderful dancers there on the, all, on the, dancing across in front of my father's uh, back. And um, I thought, I don't know whether Daddy would have enjoyed this or not. <laughs> It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We got, you know, we didn't have African dancers dancing across the square when I was there. Uh, we didn't even have any liquor for sale. In the, it was a dry county. But uh, and uh, one time, my mother, uh, my sister, had to have beer for her hair, for some kind of thing. You know, to, it was. I guess it was the fashion to use beer to. to texturize your hair in some way. And um, um, we didn't have any liquor in the house. We did not drink in our house. And, um, but my mother would do anything for us. But uh, she would always make us wish she hadn't. <laughs> so she took me along, why I don't know, me and my sister, and she went to the liquor store over the line in Fulton County. And we were just not, I mean, I would feel at home in the liquor store now. But I did not, then. I did not. And I knew my mother would just screw it up and she was saying to the guy in the liquor store, the guy is in charge, whose job was to sell liquor, she was saying, we don't drink in our house and we know people just, people don't like the taste of it. You know that, you know they don't, you don't like the taste of it. You just drink it to get tiddly. <laughs> That's one aspect of my childhood. <laughs> Anybody else? I mean, I have some more material here. Maybe I should do I'll tell you a story of uh, when um, I was in um, where was I? I was in um, the um, I forget how the story starts. I think I was what was the one I was trying to think of before? <laughs> Kathy Gomar. Sorry, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, I was, um, I'll tell you, what story should I tell them? The library. Oh, the library. I tell you, oh, yeah, going to the library in a uh, little Mississippi town. And uh, uh, I needed some directions. Clarksdale, Mississippi, the library. And I went in there. And uh, I was uh, looking for something, I was, but I figured that the library would be able to tell me how to get there. And I got in line at the desk there, and um, I was in line behind, to, just in front of me was a young black woman, and just in front of her was an elderly white man. And the elderly white man was saying, well, see, I was home, and uh, it just hit me that I wanted something. And then it hit me that what I wanted was a piece of pie. <laughs> I don't usually want pie this time of day, but I just thought I didn't, and you know, Miss Boyd sells fine pie, but Miss Boyd, Boyd not open this time of day. 
So, but I still, I wanted that, and so I thought I would come in here to the library, and the library would know where I can get a piece of pie. Only the problem then, and the lady behind the desk said, yeah, I mean, like you say, Miss Boyd, but this time of day, I just don't know. And he said, yeah, I think that, I mean, I could find a piece of pie for myself for lunch, but this time of day, and so the lady behind the desk said, uh, called back to uh, uh, the back of the stacks and said, you mean? And a faint voice said, huh? Uh, Mr. Mr. Blanchflower is here, and he wonders where he can get a piece of pie. And a faint voice came from the stacks and said, you mean this time of day? <laughs> And at that point, um, the young uh, black woman stepped forward and said, excuse me, do you have anything about the Army? Because I got to get out of this damn town. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>